Okay, it's rolling. So uh, I'll ask you again. What's your What's your name? Jane Moore Cushman. And your date of birth? Uh, Nine twenty four, nineteen twenty. And where were you born? Chattanooga, Tennessee, Erlanger Hospital. Okay. But you didn't stay there long. I mean, in Chattanooga, right? Well, my father was in the Army, and he was ordered to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. So at age five weeks, we, I was five weeks, a two-year-old brother and my mother and dad, and we went to Fort Lewis. Took five days on the train. Cross country on the train. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and so your, your dad was in the Army, uh, career Army? Career Army, yes, his regular Army. So you guys moved around a lot. Well, I don't know how long we stayed there. I do know that uh, we went from there to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and my dad went, that's the field artillery school was at Fort Sill. So uh, I don't know how long we stayed there. And then he was ordered to uh, Auburn, Alabama to be the ROTC instructor. And I think it was uh, Alabama Polytechnical Institute at the time instead of Auburn. And that's when I started remembering things when I was about three and a half or four years old. Uh, I enjoyed uh, what little we had. I remember uh, we had a car that you put curtains up. If it rains, <laughs> you could attach them. Uh, my part of uh, living in Auburn, we ended up living between two uh, fraternity houses. And I remember one of them had a barn in the back. And my, I would say the five or five years old, I think, and my dad smoked cigarettes. So my buddy and I decided we want to try that cigarette thing. <laughs> so we got up in the barn and uh, fired up the cigarettes. Well, I tried to smoke it, and I didn't like it, and I threw it out. I thought I threw it out the door outside. And he did the same thing, and we went downstairs, and run out through the woods playing and uh, about 15 minutes we heard the fire de fire department <laughs> hey let's go see where the fire is <laughs> well we ran back and the barn is burning down he looked at me and i looked at him and i said i won't tell anybody he looked at me and he said i won't tell anybody <laughs> Eventually, years and years later, I told the parents, but we never <laughs> saw them. We burned that barn down. Many years later. <laughs> Wait, was it your barn or the fraternity? Uh, fraternity's barn. barn. <laughs> uh, you know, another funny thing, uh, I'd get a nickel and I'd go down to Toomer's drugstore and get an ice cream cone. My dog always went with me. I'd take a lick and give him a lick. <laughs> <laughs> he and I'd eat the ice cream cone. Uh, Auburn, we left Auburn, and uh, my dad was ordered to Schofield Barracks, Hawaii. I remember we went through Chattanooga to visit his parents and my mother's parents. And uh, something I'll never forget, uh, I didn't like storms. And the biggest storm I've ever heard came up, and I went over, and I was holding on to my mother. And my dad looked at me, and he got up, went, got put on his raincoat and his hat, and got me a raincoat. Come here. When he said something, he said, yes, sir. So I put on this coat, and he took me out in that storm. And we walked around the block, raining, thunder, lightning, wind. We walked around that block two times. To this day, it takes a tornado to bother me. <laughs> Anyhow, we went, uh, very interesting the way the Army was working in those days. Uh, 
we're going to Hawaii, we're in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We go to New York, down the Atlantic, through the Caribbean, through the Panama Canal, up to San Francisco on a boat. Uh, we had to stay in San Francisco a couple of days. The boat had a little problem. And uh, we're staying at a place called the Presidio. It was an army base in San Francisco. And they had a cafeteria. I'd never been to a cafeteria. And uh, we went through this line. Well, of course, they had to, this one had the desserts first. I got three desserts. <laughs> my dad didn't say anything. Well, I got my regular meal, and we sat down, and we ate. And I ate about one of those desserts, and I'm like this. And I said, well, I guess that's it. My dad says, you're not through yet. <laughs> I had to eat all three of those desserts. That was a very good learning lesson right there. Anyhow, we got on the boat and went on over to Hawaii, and I enjoyed Hawaii. I went to the second, third, and fourth grade over there. I went to school with uh, Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, Filipinos, Polynesians, all these people. And you know what's interesting? I could tell one from another. Children are better at that than adults are. And uh, that was interesting. And of course, our school was only about a half a mile from Wheeler Field. And I used to go over and look at, watch the airplanes, you know, watch them fly. And uh, we were there when the first airplane flew from San Francisco to Hawaii. I, a fellow named Kingford Smith, he was an Australian, and the name of his airplane was the Southern Cross. And if you remember, the Southern Cross is in the Australian flag. Well, what he did was truly outstanding because I did that 20 years later, and it wasn't easy then. But anyhow... Uh, when we left there, we went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And uh, I remember that real well. I did a lot of writing because all the officers had, uh, had uh, polo ponies or horses. Some of them had polo ponies. And we get to, I used to get to exercise them. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, I can remember that uh, we'd be out playing, and at 5 o'clock they'd shoot the cannon on and uh, play. The bugle would come on, and they'd lower the flag, and all the children, once they fired that gun, we'd stop playing and face. We knew where the flag was, and we'd stay there. They'd play some music you could hear over the whole post. And we'd stand there looking at where the flag was until it quit, then the flag was down, then we could continue playing. I bet very few kids do anything like that nowadays. But anyhow, uh, from uh, Fort Bragg, uh, Dad was ordered to Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, I went to uh, junior high there and then my parents sent my brother and me to a school in Chattanooga called Baylor. And I ended up doing all my high school at Baylor. And I met my best friend there. He was really a neat guy. And, but anyhow, we ended up uh, going to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, we got in a fraternity, uh, Phi Gamma Delta, and I enjoyed the University of North Carolina. It was really a good school. Uh, I met an Army girl. Her dad was in the Army, and they're a different breed of cat, really, these Army girls. But anyhow, I told my best buddy, I got somebody I want you to meet. Her name was Patsy Miller. And I really liked Patsy. She was a really a delightful person. 
Well, he dated her and never dated anybody else. Ended up marrying her. But anyhow, uh, I can remember on December the 7th, it was a Sunday, and I'd had lunch, and I was walking over to the library. I had to. I wasn't the best student. I had to work hard to get anything. And this fellow ran by me and said, Cush, the Japs just bombed Pearl Harbor. I remember exactly where I was. And uh, so, of course, everybody wanted to join up. And I called my parents, and they they talked me into finishing that year and then swear, being sworn in. And so I did, and probably it was the right thing to do. Was that your first year of college? No, second year. Second? Okay. And uh, anyhow, uh, when I got home, I went down to my dad's office. He was a colonel in the Army, and he swore me in. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, it took a while, and then they called me to go to a pre-flight in San Antonio, Texas. So I went through that. I had an advantage over a lot of them because I knew how the Army worked. Yeah. And I knew how to goof off a little better than they did. But uh, anyhow, from there, there was one incident that happened. The best job is be the guidon carrier. That's a little flag for your squadron. Okay. Yeah. And I got pretty good. I could hit it with my shoulder and it'd go out and I'd hold it. That salute and as you go by the reviewing stand, I missed it one day. <laughs> and there's a general up here on the, in the reviewing stand. Well, anyhow, it hit the ground and bounced and I caught it and went right on through. <laughs> We got back over to the squadron. There were two squadrons right next to each other, and here comes the TAC officer. Boy, I knew he was going to be all over me. He walked right by me and went to the other squadron and chewed that boy out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Anyhow, pre-flight was interesting. Then I went to a place called Fort, Fort Hicksville in Fort Worth, Texas. And that's when we started flying, and I flew the PT-19. And from there, we went to Enid, Oklahoma, where we flew the BT-13 and the BT-15. And from there, I went to uh, Victoria, Texas, where we flew the AT-6. And then uh, we flew down to Matagorda Island from there. It was a satellite deal where we had our gunnery. And uh, then I graduated and became a second lieutenant, United States Air Force, uh, the Army Air Corps at yeah. that time. And uh, uh, they shipped us all to Tallahassee, uh, with a bunch of us that wanted to be fighter pilots. And then at Tallahassee, they, I ended up going to a place called Waycross, Georgia. And uh, I think I flew a P-39 one time, and then they took them out, and we had P-40s. And uh, in the P-40 deal, they train you on all the things, and the primary thing is gunnery. And I made a big mistake, or thought I did at that time. I outshot all the instructors. and. So I ended up being an instructor, and I didn't get to go to the war. So I spent the war teaching people how to pick up a lead when they're shooting. Uh, after that was all, when the war was over, uh, I put in for a regular commission, my dad having been in the service, and I got a, a regular army commission. Uh, ended up, I went to several bases, uh, I guess about four or five, and then they all of a sudden sent me to Tokyo. And in Tokyo, I spent a short time there, and they decided they needed some people in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. 
So they sent me down with another big group of officers to the Philippines. And I was supposed to go to Clark Field and fly the fighters. And for some reason, the orders got screwed up and they put me in a complete another deal. I was supposed to do in the supply business, which I knew nothing about. But anyhow, after about two weeks there, there were 13 of us that went down there. They called us all together. And they said, we've got to send two back to Tokyo. Well, the two guys in the front got that one. And then they wanted two to Okinawa and two to Clarkfield and two to Nicholsville and two to Guam. They wanted to send one guy to Hawaii. And I held up my hand. I said, that's me. <laughs> and nobody said anything. Well, I won't go through how I left there, but I left there in a hurry. And I went to Hawaii. And what was ironic, uh, the first day I was there, I wrote a letter to my mother. And uh, what's ironic, she got a letter from my father and me, both dated the same day from Honolulu. My dad was on command of a troop ship going to Korea. He was taken over as governor of uh, Korea. And... Uh, it was ironic. We were both there within three miles of each other and didn't know it. <laughs> but anyhow, I spent a couple of years in Hawaii uh, flying all over the Pacific. Really interesting, some of the islands we flew to. Yeah, what, what were you flying at the time? Well, I started out flying cargo airplanes. I'm a fighter pilot. We flew C-47s and C-46s. Uh, probably the first six, eight months, and then they gave us C-54s, the four-engine job, much nicer over all that water. And uh, then uh, the Berlin airlift started, the Russians trying to run the Americans and the British and the French out of Berlin, which was known as West Berlin. And I walked out of a movie one night. I'd gone over with my good friend and my wife to have dinner. And then there was an open air movie right close to the officers club. And we all went over there, but we got separated. My wife and I had to sit way down front and he had to find somewhere else to sit. Well, I heard a little commotion halfway through the movie, but couldn't hear what it was, so we watched the movie. And when it was over, I thought we'd go over and have a nightcap and go home. We could walk back to our quarters. We're only two blocks from the club. And my buddy was standing out there, and he was in uniform. He'd gone in the movie in civilian clothes. And I said, what are you doing, playing Boy Scout or something? He said, Kush. Your crew is down in operations and they're flight planning the whole thing right now and you're taking the first airplane out of here. They got you scheduled first out of here. I said, where are we going? He said, we're going to Massachusetts. I said, no, we're not. We're going to Germany. I read the papers. 45 minutes after I walked out of that movie, I was pulling it off the ground, headed for San Francisco. And I didn't get home for seven months. Wow. That was very difficult on my wife. And uh, I had just spent February of uh, 48 to uh, the end of April, three months, on Guadalcanal. We were supporting an engineer regiment down there that was mapping the Solomons and they needed an operations officer, and I, unfortunately, got the job. Well, I could tell you a lot of stories about Guadalcanal. I used to hunt crocodiles, which is kind of interesting, and I had a little airplane that I would fly and spray the area about three times a week, uh, and then I'd fly up these rivers and I'd spot where the crocodiles were and I'd come back and land. And there was a fellow that worked with the engineers that had 
aerial photos of all the ma all the rivers, and I'd say, we've got a big one on this sandbar. Let's go get it. We hunted crocodiles, wild boar, ducks, all that business. On Guadalcanal. On Guadalcanal. Never, never imagined there would be crocodiles there. They got big crocodiles there, ocean going. They go from one island to another. Hmm. They are big down there. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny one. One day I was taken off to go spray and a bunch of my buddies had come in the night before and they were going on down to Sydney. About the time I was, they were going to get out in their airplane and. Uh, they said, Kush, I'd been down there three, three months at the time, and I was going home pretty soon, but guess what we're going to do in Sydney? Well, hell, I've been to Sydney. I knew what they were going to be doing. Uh, you can have a lot of fun in Sydney. But anyhow, I took off, and the devil made me do it. They're walking out to the airplane. And I get about this high off the ground, and I'm headed right for them. This one guy said, look out, and they all laid down. Gave him a little shot of the spray. And I pulled up, and I looked back, and they're all doing this. Lay back down, boys. I came back, they laid back down, then I made a quick turn, and they're all running for the hangar. So I went sprayed, and then I found the auxiliary field, and I landed, and I sat there, and I waited. Then I could hear them take off, then I cracked up and went back over. Oh, Lord have mercy. Well, anyhow, I got back uh, the first of May or the last of April. Then the last of June, first of July, I leave for seven more months to fly the Berlin Airlift. And that... I went over, I think, as an airplane driver, and I came home a full-fledged pilot. <clears throat> the weather, the weather in Germany is a, is sorry weather, and in the winter time, it's awful. I landed one time in, in Tempelhof, and never saw the runway until I put the nose wheel down. We used a thing called ground control approach, GCA. And uh, one of our lieutenants in my squadron had talked to general, told the general we had to have GCA because he had flown in Germany in the wintertime. And the general got us GCAs at every base and every approach. The sky could be beautiful, sunshine, GCA. GCA. We got so good at it, and the, and the ground people that ran it got so good at it that I landed that one night because he talked me right down to the runway. Hmm. Anyhow, that You were flying what then? The C-54s that we'd been flying all over the Pacific. Yeah. Uh, I finally flew my last flight about the sixth day of January, 1949. And the airlift went on till September. By that time, when we first got there, we didn't have enough pilots. I was working 14 days, uh, 14 hours a day. And finally we got some more pilots in that really helped out. From there, I flew back to the States, and my brother was in Bangor, Maine, and I hadn't seen him in three or four years, so well, I'm in Massachusetts. That's pretty close, so yeah. I went up there. But before I went, this sergeant came up and said, uh, I was the lieutenant. He said, Lieutenant, you're supposed to be at Fort Dix uh, tomorrow. I said, I can't make it, Sergeant. I'm going up to Bangor, Maine. He said, well, it says here you're supposed to. I said, I know it, but I haven't seen my brother, and I'm going up and seeing him. So I went up to see him, spent two or three days with him, and I went down to Fort Dix, and there was a major there that didn't like me because I didn't report when I was supposed to. And he said, uh, I'm going to send you to Smoky Hill, Kansas, to fly old B-29s. 
I said, Major, I don't want to go to Smoky Hill, Kansas and fly B-29s. He said, well, that's where you're going. So I got a handful of quarters, and I had two buddies in Hawaii. One was in personnel, and one was something else, but he was a West Pointer and a good friend, both of them. I got a handful of quarters, and both of them had been transferred to the Pentagon. So I called the Pentagon, and I got them both on the phone. <laughs> and uh, so they just wanted to know all about the Berlin airlift. So, of course, I briefed them, and finally one of them said, what you call us for? I said, let me tell you something. There's a major up here who wants to send me to Smoky Hill, Kansas. I don't want to go to Smoky Hill, Kansas. And the personnel guy said, where do you want to go? I said, I want to go to Tinkerfield in Oklahoma City, and I want to get in flight test. And uh, they said, well, call us back this afternoon. <laughs> I said, you got it. I called them back. They said, you're going to Tinkerfield. <laughs> I reported to the major the next day, and he was, boy, he was put out. He said, I don't know what happened, but there's a change in your orders. You're going to Tinkerfield. <laughs> oh, really? I wonder how that happened. <laughs> Anyhow, I went to Tinkerfield. Way to go. Way to go. That's in Oklahoma City, and I reported in to the chief of maintenance, who was a full colonel. Real nice, smartest man I ever ran into. And uh, he said, well, what do you want to do, Cushman? I said, uh, sir, I'd like to get in flight test. I'm qualified, single twin, four engines. He said, that sounds good. Um, it's Thursday. Why don't you go get organized and report in Monday morning, and we'll get going. So I reported in Monday morning, and... Uh, there's a major sitting outside of the colonel's office. He said, your name Cushman? I said, yes, sir. He said, that's your desk right over there. I said, is that part of flight test? He said, that's part of production control. Production control? I don't know anything about production control. He said, well, that's your job right there. You're the assistant to the assistant. There was a major and a captain and me. I thought, God Almighty. Anyhow, they gave me my first job is we have misplaced $5 million and we don't know where it is and we want you to find it. I didn't know where to go to look for something like that. Anyhow, it took me about two weeks and I worked and I found out a lot in those two weeks about a lot of things. And uh, anyhow, I came back and I said, I, this is my report I'd given them. I said, I found four and a half million. I couldn't find that other 500,000. And they, they clapped their hands, yay! <laughs> so we lose 500,000. Anyhow, to make the story a little bit shorter, uh, the major left after six months and the captain became chief of production control and then in the next six months I made captain and said six months after the major left the captain left I am now acting chief of production control I'm a pilot the production control and these people evidently work for me 700 civilians the 700 civilians wrote all the work orders which control 16,000 people in the maintenance division and 8,000 in the supply division because we were their biggest customers. That was my job. They would send a, 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 a deal down for us to do from Wright-Patterson and I'd have to read it and I had four people working for me that had between them a, a hundred years of maintenance experience. Two of them old enough to be my daddy, and they work for me. Anyhow, I'd give them the report, and let them uh, see what they wanted, what they thought, and then I'd call them in my office, and we'd all talk, and, Charlie, what do you think? He'd give his deal. Jack, how about you? And I'd give them all. I'm putting it all up here instead <laughs> of talking. 
And uh, anyhow, when I got through, I'd say, well, do you think we can do... And they would say, well, yeah, we can do it that way. That'll work. And then Charlie would say, well, there's one thing. How about this one area, so and so and so and so. I said, what do y'all think? They said, yeah, yeah, I think that's a good idea. I said, okay, let's go with it. I didn't try to run everything because they so much smarter than I was, it was unreal. But anyhow, uh, I did that for about two years, and on that base, I flew 20 different airplanes. We had a colonel who said, you feel big enough to fly it, go fly it. <laughs> uh, I, I have a buddy I play golf with here, and he was, flew with United. He's flown all the Boeing airplanes. Mm -hmm. He said, Kush, uh, uh, how did you check out in the jet when you were in the service? Because for them, they had to go to ground school and do all that sort of thing. I said, well, I was working one Saturday because I playing catch up because during the week all I was doing was putting out brush fires so I had some extra work and I was in my office and there was a fellow down flight test a buddy of mine he called me he said Cush you've been wanting to fly a jet haven't you well I knew where all the airplanes were and I knew there was a T-33 down there somewhere I thought that's what he was talking about I said sure he said, well, come on down, let's fly. Well, I kept a locker down there because I used to help them fly if they had a big load. And so I put on my flying suit, and he didn't. I didn't understand that. So we walk out in front of the flight test, F-84B. I'd never seen that airplane. So anyhow, I get in the airplane. It's single seat. I knew the radios. Uh, he told me the hydraulic system, the fuel system, how to start it, and all that sort of business. And uh, so, okay. So he said, wait just a minute. Let me check something. He was up on the wing right next to the cockpit. He went over. The, it had tip tanks. Mm -hmm. he, he did the relief valve, took the cap off, looked at it. It's full. Puts the cap back on, comes back, to me and said, you better not fly it. I said, why? He said, the tips are full. I said, can you fly it that way? He said, oh yeah. I said, hell, I'm better pilot than you are. Get off the wing. <laughs> so I cranked it up, taxied out, took off, flew around, found a B-29, shot him down three times, and, and uh, finally decided I better go land. I noticed I'd used a lot of fuel. <laughs> So I came in and you pitch up in fighters and come around and land. Well, everything was fine till I got around and leveled off and then all of a sudden the left wing dropped. Power, stick, I kept the approach. It had wide landing gear, thank God. I landed with the stick completely over here, not here, over here and I had the right rudder in I got it on the runway. I taxied in and I said, he came out, I said, who flew this airplane? He said, I did. I said, well, hell, there's something wrong with it. And I told him what I'd done. You probably didn't hear me when I first said he pulled the relief valve and then opened the cap. He put the cap back on but never reset the relief valve and air pressure from the engine goes in and forces the gas into the tanks that, that for it feeds the engine. I landed with a full tip tank. That's my checkout and jet engines, jets. That was my checkout. <laughs> well, anyhow, uh, about then uh, they were building the B-47 and uh, General LeMay, was the guy that wanted to hold the Russians at bay. So he looked for captains and majors that had at least 4,000 flying hours and preferably in the regular service. I fed all of that. I didn't want to go. <laughs> but he wanted us to be navigators, 
radar, uh, could handle radar and bombing. So we had to go to these classes. So I went from there to Houston, Texas, became a navigator. Then we went to a base in Sacramento and uh, we dropped bombs and uh, did all and did the radar and all that sort of business. And then they sent me to Roswell, New Mexico. They didn't have all the B-47s built yet. And they put me in a B-29 outfit. <laughs> Golly, I'll never forget that. Anyhow, I had a few experiences there. I won't go through them. And finally, they got some airplanes and they, uh, we were shipped to uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana. Yeah. I call it Lake Charlie by the Swamp. <laughs> and anyhow, went down to Florida to check out in the B-47. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I went to Wichita, Kansas and picked up my airplane. Everybody picked up their own airplane. And I'll never forget Coming back, we were up about 34, 35,000 feet, and all of a sudden, the airplane just was jumping around like mad, and I thought, what in the world was that? It's my first experience with the jet stream. And I asked the navigator, I said, what in the world was that? He said, Kush, we're flying long, and the wind up here was was from the south at about 20 knots, and all of a sudden it's from the west at 200 knots. Well, that's a big difference. You fly into it. Yeah. Anyhow, that was my first experience with jet streams. I spent three years uh, there flying, and uh, I was ordered to Tampa, Florida, because I was the first one in the group that went through the evaluation for the B-47 and passed it out of my wing. But anyhow, I was ordered down there, and uh, my wing commander called me in his office. He said, I'm being ordered to Thule, and I'm not asking anybody in the wing to go except you. I'd like for you to go with me. Well, I got to thinking about that. My wife was pregnant, do any time, and I'm supposed to be in Tampa, Florida, and so I explained to him that, and I said, uh, under the circumstances, can I take a rain check? And he said, you've got it. I'm going to be the DO of 15th Air Force when I come back, and I'll call for you. So I went down to... Uh, Tampa. Of course, the difference in temperature is 160 degrees. When it's 99 down in Florida, it's a minus 66 in Thule. You know where Thule is? No. Northern Greenland. Oh. It's in the Arctic Circle. Golly. I didn't want, I don't like cold weather. <laughs> but anyhow, I spent, uh, two years down there, and then they sent uh, the, that group to Shreveport and set up a program that was fantastic. And uh, I was there two years, and then I had a chance to go to b 58 or go to Spain. And my children were four and seven or four and eight, and I thought maybe and I'm up to 40 years old. I go to Spain and they get to uh, learn a little bit about a foreign country. So I went to Spain and I spent three years over there. I ended up in, uh, you always get in different jobs. I was ended up as director of safety for 16th Air Force. We had 122 B-47s, three in Spain and three in Morocco, three bases. They all had the big weapon. And that was part of my job, was nuclear safety. 
flying safety and ground safety and all of that. Well, it all worked out very well. I'll tell you one story that's kind of interesting. Uh, this one colonel, I think he was a lawyer, jumped up. We had a staff meeting every morning in the command post, and uh, they're briefing the general primarily, and when they do that, I'm up there working on some. They had to deal like that. This colonel jumps up and said, General, why didn't the base commander at Saragossa call a broken arrow? A broken arrow is when you got a bomb that might go off. And uh, what had happened, one of the B-47s had started the engines for an alert, practice alert, and the engine caught fire. And it's got a bomb on board. Well, they didn't call a broken arrow. And uh, this colonel was really put out that they didn't do it. And the general turned around to me, he said, Cushman, Go up there and tell me what you think. And I want you to report to me in the morning. I said, yes, sir. So I flew up there and when I landed, the deputy commander met me. He said, uh, the commander wants you to come up to his office right now. I said, I'm not going up to his office right now. I want to go see the airplane. I want to see what happened here and I want to talk to some people. I want to talk to the fire chief, and I want to talk to the security chief, and I want to talk to the maintenance chief. So I did all of that. And uh, he said, well, at the time, he said, he wants you now. I said, I don't work for him. I work for the general. Okay. So I go up to the office, and he has his whole staff in the office. And I knew him, and I said, George, uh, we don't need all these people in here. So they all left. And he looked at me and he said, well, I said, I think you did a great job. I would have done the same thing you did. You could see relief. <laughs> so the next morning, uh, this colonel jumps up again and starts talking. Well, what about this? And the general turned to me and says, Cushman, I said, General, I think he did a nice job. He handled it very nicely, exactly the way I would have, and I'm sure the way you would have. He said, thank you. Turn around. <laughs> this colonel, he didn't understand. Most people in Spain didn't know that we had all those bombs in Spain. You know what you have to do when you call a broken arrow? Everybody for 10 miles has to get out away. And the city of Saragossa was within 10 miles. Then everybody in Spain would know we've got atomic bombs. God, this colonel was stupid. You got to keep a secret. You know, we did have an airplane crash over there that was carrying uh, weapons uh, during the Cuban thing. And uh, I was gone at the time. No, it wasn't. It was after the Cuban thing, because I was there during the Cuban thing. But anyhow, uh, this colonel wanted flying time, and they had to refuel over Spain, going back to the States, because they had gone down to the far end of the Mediterranean and he crashed into the tanker. And they dropped one, I think one or two bombs hit in Spain and a couple of them went in the Mediterranean. Wow. I saw the general uh, later on. He came back, took over the second Air Force and I was stationed at Lincoln. <laughs> he said, he saw me, he says, Cushman, damn it. Why in the hell did you leave before they had that accident? <laughs> the guy we had couldn't handle it, and so I had to do everything. <laughs> Anyhow, from Spain, uh, they sent me to Lincoln, Nebraska. And I ended up being DO, Director of Operations there. 
And uh, I didn't want to go to Lincoln, Nebraska, <laughs> but I had to go. And the uh, first month I was there, the fellow I was replacing had another month. So I got all the additional duties that keep me busy. And one of them was the United Fund. And the base had never met their quota. They're usually about 50% of what they should do. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't doing anything and I worked out a plan and we ended up doing 125% of quota. And in the process, I got to meet everybody downtown that's worth knowing. Editor of the paper, the mayor, I even got to know the governor. The, you know, they're there in Lincoln. And uh, that was really a blessing. And then I took over and I was there for uh, three years. And in the process, uh, uh, I was divorced. And uh, there was some lady with the TV that wanted me to do a show with her. Uh, she did these talk shows. Okay. And I told her, I didn't think I'd like to do that, but she kind of talked me into it. She said, real simple. Well, I'm leaving Lincoln going to Shreveport, and I'm leaving in about two days, and all my officers that work for me got me together at the club and got me drunk. They were feeding me all this whiskey. Great bunch of guys. But anyhow, I didn't feel very good the next morning. And I went down there and I said, Rita, I don't feel very well. I don't think I ought to do this. So anyhow, she was feeding me coffee Drink that coffee, you'll feel better and all that. Well, finally she talked me into sitting down. So we sat down and we started talking. And one of her questions, where were you stationed before you came here? And she said, I told her, uh, Madrid, Spain. And she said, did you like it? I said, oh yeah, I really did like it. Uh, I work right for the boss. and. Uh, she said, well, what did you think when you got to order to Lincoln, Nebraska? I said, I thought it was the worst thing could happen to me. And everybody in that state were like this. And, you know, I said, but, you know, uh, since I've been here, because I'd met all those people, I think Lincoln is one of the greatest cities in the country. The people here are so nice. You can't find anybody. You go down south and you don't find people like there are in Lincoln. So I was very fortunate to be stationed here this time. Of course, that calmed everything <laughs> down. Well, anyhow, I left in a couple of days and I went down to uh, Shreveport and I, they gave me that job. I didn't want that job. The reason I went down there is because the general the same general that was in Spain that now heads up 2nd Air Force uh, had a meeting with all the base commanders and they, uh, he asked the commander at Lincoln, uh, where's Cushman going? They were closing the base. And he said, I think he's been sent to Charleston to be with some outfit in Charleston, which was not sacked. And the general said, you must be kidding. Well, everybody's writing, you know. Next thing I know, my orders are changed. I'm going to Shreveport instead of Charleston. And I did not want to go because the general had asked for me. That's a death sentence. Unless you work directly for him. And there was a guy that had the inside with the general and wanted me to be his D.O. of the base. Well, you don't want a general to tell people that you want this guy because they're going to watch you like a hawk. So anyhow, I stayed there. Hey, Stacy. Hey, Dad. Hey. 
Jeff, this is, we're right in the middle of talking something, Stacy. Okay. <laughs> we're almost through. Y'all go ahead. I'm going to work in here. So, anyhow, I stayed there uh, about two years and then I decided to retire. It's about time to get out. So, I came to Birmingham. And, uh, what brought you here? Pardon? What brought you to Birmingham? Uh, my parents lived here, her parents lived here, she had lived here, so we came back here, we got the kids and children in school, and I was looking around, they wanted uh, this general out at the airport call me and said, how would you like to be the airport manager? And, oh, he asked me first if I'd ever run one. I'd, two of the biggest bases in uh, SAC. And I told him that. He said, well, what do you think? I said, let me check it. Well, I checked it, and I went back, and I said, General, I don't want to do that. Why? I said, politicians, they tell you something one minute, and the next day they change their minds, and I'm used to somebody telling me something, I'll take it to the bank. So anyhow, uh, they wanted me then to fly company jets. I was one of two in Birmingham in 1969 that was qualified in company jets. Uh, I didn't want to do that because somebody wanted to go somewhere. I got to get up and take them, you know. So then, uh, what else? One other deal they wanted me to do. But anyhow, I ended up getting in the insurance business. Uh, I liked it because I had no inventory, nobody worked for me, and I worked strictly commissioned. And we had a place down in Panama City, and if Ellen and I wanted to go to the beach, we'd get in the car and go to the beach. I would schedule my calls and everything. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, it worked out very nicely. Uh, I spent 15 years with uh, Liberty National, and then 16 years with uh, uh, Protective, and I'd been in the service 27 years, so when I hit 80, I decided I would hang it up. I had a few more years to go. Well, that was 21 years ago. <laughs> I've been very fortunate, uh, the places I've been, the things I've done, uh, I could tell you so many little things, but that would take days. I bet you could, and uh, I'd, I'd love to hear some. You know, it's funny, the, the more you're talking and all, and especially knowing that you worked at, with Protective, and I, I knew when I was given your name, Gene Cushman, I knew it sounded familiar, and it had to be from Protective Life, because I usually would know or see the names on the list of people who were going on these trips or top producers, because I would design the, uh, I think it was Lifelines magazine, mm -hmm. and you know do the d production of those. So I would see all these names, and so I'd. I'm sure I did see you then, I just didn't put it together until now. How about that? <laughs> well, you know, uh, one thing I didn't discuss that was one of my favorites uh, here in Birmingham was playing golf. And I, I had a fairly good record here. Um, when I first came, I was just an average golfer, about a 15 handicap or something. But I noticed that they would mark off how far they were from the pin. I'd never done that. I'd just look at it and eyeball it and say, well, that's a five iron, and I'd hit it. Mm -hmm. So I started doing that, and I got to be pretty good at it, and I ended up uh, shooting my age when I was 67. That's the first time I did that. And I had a friend named Phil Cook who wanted me to keep a record of how many times I shot under my age. Yeah. 
and I just didn't do it. And finally, it's interesting, when I hit 69, he was really after me because I'd been shooting under my age a bunch. And he said, uh, you got to do it, Cushman. I said, okay, I'll do it. So I started keeping it then. But then I'd play these different courses and I wouldn't put it in the deal. So I decided that I would keep a record of how many times I shot over my age. And from 79 to 100, I shot over my age one time. <laughs> and the best, you won't believe this, I was playing, I was, oh, I was in my 90s and I was playing from the front tees. We have five sets of tees. Uh -huh. uh, but I didn't hit the ball very far. But when I was 95, I shot a 74. That's 21 strokes under my age. <laughs> Well, uh, I enjoyed. A lot of people can do that. <laughs> well, there are people. There's one guy uh, the, I think has a record of 26 strokes under his age. He was really a good golfer. But anyhow, I did a lot of golfing in the last 20 years. But since I lost my wife, uh, I've had a trouble with my knee and my left leg, so. I think my golfing days are about over. So, anyhow, that's basically uh, up to now. I didn't hit a lot of little things, but that yeah. would take days. That's you did. That's amazing. It's intriguing story on your career and all the different things you've done. Um, let me ask you one one more thing. Uh, I'll try to remember to ask all the veterans this, is, but it's especially being a centenarian now, you're, you're, uh, what, do you have any advice for younger generations today? Just life advice, I guess. Well, the thing that worries me is people nowadays don't know anything about the United States. I ask questions to everybody. I go in the bank, I talk to the teller. Most of them just sit there and give you money and yeah. never say, most of them want to talk. I ask them questions. You know what I ask them? What's the northernmost state of the United States? You'd be surprised how many have no idea. Or the south, or the west, or the east. I asked one woman who was the first president, she didn't know. I asked people who was the fourth president. He had a lot to do with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. They don't know. They don't know capitals of states. All of my grandchildren know all the capitals. I make a point that they do a little geography. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know if you know North, East, South, and West, but I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to ask you because you may not know. Maybe you do. The northernmost state is Alaska. The southernmost state is Hawaii. The westernmost state is Alaska. And the easternmost state is Alaska. Now, how many people know that? Part of Alaska is in the Eastern Hemisphere. People don't know that. A lot of people don't know that in the contiguous states, Minnesota is the northernmost state. Maine is eastern, Florida is southern, and Washington is western. You ask them, where can you stand in one spot in the United States and be standing in four states? You know that one? I've been there. Well, you know it. There are people that don't know that. They don't know the capitals. Gosh. They don't know the history of, yeah. of the country. I, if I were governor, all the children would say the Pledge of Allegiance every day. I would put 
the Ten Commandments in every school. If people, you know, when children are young, that's when you teach them and you head them in the right direction. There are so many not doing that now. That's what I would say. I, I don't think the U.S. government should run the education program. I think each state should run it. And if you want intelligent people and uh, good workers and people that are smart enough to work on these tough jobs, give them an education. The government screws up everything they get involved in. Hush. I wonder how many people realize how Washington has slowly taken over telling you what to do when we should be telling them what to do. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, those people in Washington, you know, it's like the frog that you put in the water and then boil it. Yeah. That's what's Very happening. To, that's what's happening to these people in this country. I don't know. Golly.